Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. I'm really honored to be part of the evening tonight. My name is Sandy Tolan. Uh, I'm a journalist and a writer and the author of a book that you'll be hearing a little bit about tonight and the context of which helps explain um, some of our evening. This is really mostly an evening of music, so I'm not going to take too much time, but I wanted to explain a little bit about how this evening came about, uh, in particular how the book that I'm holding in my hands, Children of the Stone, came about. Um, and it gives a little bit of context into uh, the struggle uh, between Israel and the Palestinians, and in particular the Palestinian experience in the world, uh, much of which is, is really not known to many Americans, despite the many, many uh, thousands of articles and, and reports that, that come through uh, the daily news. Uh, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is how I met uh, this remarkable man that you'll be hearing from tonight, Ramzi Abaredwan and his Daluna Ensemble, uh, who you'll be hearing from in just a few minutes. But I wanted to take a little bit of time to explain some of the context and maybe do a little bit of a reading and then Ramzi's going to join me and talk a bit about his remarkable music school, al Kamanjati which is Arabic for the violinist, which has really transformed the lives of thousands of, of young Palestinians, Palestinian children across the West Bank in particular. Um, but I, I'll start out by just explaining a little bit about how I came to know Ramzi and then how I came to uh, write about uh, his experience and the experience of all these children in uh, his al Kamajati music school was back in 1998, I was uh, doing research for a book that became The Lemon Tree, some of you may be familiar with that. And uh, at that time that I was doing research uh, for what I was hoping would be a book that would tell this story of one Israeli and one Palestinian, and in fact it became that book that was published in, in uh, 2006, but I was distracted by these posters all over Ramallah that were pasted up of a little boy with a stone in his hand, fear and anger in his eyes. And that poster uh, was of little Ramzi Hussein uh, Abu Ridwan at age eight throwing a stone in the first Palestinian intifada in late 1987, early 88. But on that same poster juxtaposed next to that image of a child was an image of a young 18-year-old young man, Ramzi Abu Redwan, it turned out, also playing the viola. And on that poster it said, Ramzi, 1987, 1997, uh, and then it said, Palestine National Conservatory of Music. And in a sense it was this symbol, this metaphor for a very hopeful time uh, back in, in uh, the early so-called Oslo years, that there would be two states standing side by side in peace, a Palestine and an Israel. And Ramzi, in a sense, symbolized that. He didn't seek to symbolize it, but a lot of people, uh, excuse me, read things into it and wanted to see this, uh, this poster as a sort of sense of the possibility at the time. So I was also fascinated and went and sought him out, um, distracted myself from, from my, my main research at that time, because I was so interested in finding out who he was. Turns out he lived in a refugee camp called Al Amri, which is right next to Ramallah, where I was at the time. I met him, talked to him, spent a lot of time with him, and uh, he told me, I did a piece for NPR back in the, at that time in 98, and he told me, I asked him what his dreams were, and he had just come back from a music camp in New Hampshire. He had essentially laid down the stone and picked up a viola, uh, but he already had this idea that he would start music schools in Palestine. Here's a kid who is 18 years old. He didn't have any financial resources, but he had this burning dream and a, a lot of intelligence, a lot of passion, a lot of charisma. Uh, and then he got a scholarship as well uh, to study in France. Uh, and he began studying the viola there. I, I visited him there once and then lost touch with him until December of 2009, a little over five years ago, uh, when I was on another much more grim assignment uh, about the dismal state of affairs uh, for the so-called peace process. And I was in the West Bank and I walked into an Italian restaurant in Ramallah 
And there was Ramsey. I hadn't seen him in almost a decade. And he was sitting in the corner. First, I didn't recognize him because he'd grown a beard. And he pointed at himself and said, Ramsey. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I'm back in Palestine. I said, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm opening up music schools for the children of Palestine. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, sort of getting the chills that he joined us at the table. and We talked uh, about how he had actually done everything he had set out to do. And he invited me to come along and experience what he'd done and how he had opened up all these possibilities for Palestinian children. And so I did. And little did I know at that night, that December night of 2009, that uh, my life would take a different path for the next five years until this book came out uh, just uh, a few months ago in April. And the reason I spent so much time with this, uh, it's, it's twofold. One is the story of Ramsey and what he's been through, the loss that he's gone through as a, as a symbol of what so many other Palestinians have also gone through um, is remarkable in itself. And this ability to stick with a dream and never let go and how, how doing that can make such a difference in, in the, difference in the lives of thousands of people is also a universal story. And there was a universal story of music at the heart of this. Uh, classical music, which he learned, and also Arabic music, which you'll hear a lot of tonight. So, but, but beyond that, I thought, here's a chance to go to a place, Palestine, the West Bank, uh, and really look at how day-to-day -day life is experienced. Because precious little is known about how Palestinian children, for example, experience their lives. The fact that there are literally hundreds of checkpoints and other barriers, uh, several hundred in a land the size of the state of Delaware, our second smallest state. The fact that th these children have to be subjected to, to checkpoints and inspections and their families get night raids sometimes when the soldiers come. And just the experience of a day-to-day -day life seems so off the radar, and I wanted to chronicle that, not in a polemical way, or not in some sort of policy report, but in a human sort of novelistic way. So that's why I took as much time as I did. I didn't really expect that I would. That's why the book took five years, and I interviewed a couple hundred people, but particularly Ramsey. I kept going back again and again, and I really wanted to explain uh, more than anything, what the experience is for these children. And uh, so uh, the book uh, is sort of weaves the, the history with the day-to-day -day experience in, in what I hope is a, is a novelistic way. And again, like I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time doing uh, long readings, but I want to read one thing to you. And then uh, Ramsey will join me, and in case you have any questions before the music starts, uh, he can tell a little bit about his experience with the school. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to read a little bit from one of the chapters um, uh, that's telling the story of, of two sisters. Um, one of the experiences that I came to understand as I began meeting these kids and figuring out which kids to try to focus on and, and tell, tell their stories was that a lot of them have been so traumatized. You know, the older folks by the first intifada, the much older folks by the Palestinian Nakba, the catastrophe when so many went into exile during the creation of Israel, but also the younger kids, the children who are still children, uh, the trauma that they went, uh, went through during the second intifada, uh, and the, which was much more violent than the first. Trying to explain that um, and to try to see how, as they be got a little older, music entered their lives from Ramsey's Music School and how I saw, and, and it's, it's supported by a lot of studies from, uh, from brain neurologists and, uh, and sociologists and musicologists, that music makes a huge difference in the lives of children. And it really can transform uh, the self-worth and the sense of, of self of, of, of these children. And I began to see that uh, again and again in, in talking to these kids. I want to read one thing from 
from uh, two of these girls. Uh, the first one, uh, she's on the cover of the book. Her name is Ala Shalalda. She's now 17 years old, but uh, at the time that this thing happened to her in 2008, uh, she was uh, only 10. One evening, riding home from a concert in Bethlehem, Ala Rasha, that's her older sister, and a few of their fellow musicians suddenly came upon a military barrier erected hastily in the road. Halt, commanded a sign in Arabic and Hebrew. Just beyond, an olive-clad soldier was checking documents. Flying checkpoint, Rasha said. These were the temporary barriers the military erected on the fly for the stated purpose of catching suspected militants and those without proper documents who might try to evade the fixed checkpoints, also known as random or surprise checkpoints. They were so ubiquitous that Allah and Rasha were never surprised to encounter them. It's normal, Allah said. And that's one of the things that, that came to me again and again is that these children have grown up in an occupation, a military occupation in the West Bank that is now, this past June, turned 48 years old. So anybody who hasn't had a chance to travel, all children who haven't had a chance to travel, this is actually normal. And that's one of the things that really struck me again and again as I saw what their normal was. More than any other single reality in Palestine, checkpoints defined life under occupation. By 2008, the number of flying checkpoints had reached 90 per week, part of the 630 closure obstacles Israel had erected across the West Bank, a territory slightly smaller than the state of Delaware. Three-fourths of the main roads leading into the West Bank's biggest cities and towns were now blocked or controlled by checkpoints. Military authorities said the strict measures were necessary to protect Israeli lives. Palestinians and humanitarian organizations saw them as a means for Israel to control the occupied population and protect the movements of settlers who had illegally seized Palestinian lands. What was once justified by the Israeli authorities as a short-term military response to violent confrontations and attacks on Israeli civilians uh, declared a report from the United Nations, appears to be developing into a permanent system, a system which is fragmenting the West Bank territory and affecting the freedom of movement of the entire Palestinian population. At the flying checkpoint, the van carrying Allah and Rasha slowed and came to a stop. The sisters gazed at the sign. Behind the soldier, a military Humvee blocked the road. The soldier beckoned the van forward. He opened the sliding door. What's that? A soldier asked Allah, pointing to her soft blue instrument case. This is a violin, replied Allah. Do you know, do you know how to play? He asked. Yes. The soldier told her to step out of the van. Play, instructed the soldier. Don't play for him, Rasha yelled in Arabic. Play, repeated the soldier. Allah frowned looking into the van uncertainly. Muntasser, the clarinet player, said softly, it's okay, play Habibti, play my dear. Ramzi's main purpose for founding al Kamanjati, he had said many times, was to protect the children from the soldiers. The statement often sounded like a slogan or a soundbite, but Allah, Rasha, and other children of al Kamanjati had begun to wear their music as a kind of armor and now, at the flying checkpoint, Allah calmly removed her violin, placed it under her chin, stood erect, and began to play. She had chosen El Halwadi, or The Beautiful Girl, a song by Syed Darwish, made famous by Feruz. A haunting melody floated from Allah's little violin, an oriental sound, as it was called in Israel in the West, certain and strong, Allah's notes cut through the low rumble of idling cars and floated above the flying checkpoint into the night air. 
We saw in his eyes, he was shocked, Allah remembered. It was something he didn't understand. In the melody, the sisters could recall the words about a penniless child whose mood is serene, for she has put her life in God's hands. With patience, change will come. All will be better. Rasha, staring intently from inside the van, felt a surge of pride in her little sister playing unfazed. They claim that we are people with no identity, but Allah proved them wrong, she said. Music, Rasha believed, was not only a source of pride, it was a means of assertion, protection, and even at times, vengeance. Then the moment turned. Another soldier walked over to listen. He was smiling and seemed to be enjoying the impromptu concert. I play too, he said when Allah finished. May I try? Another soldier asked Amir, the guitar student, if he could borrow his instrument. The soldiers began to play, smiling at Allah and her fellow musicians who gaped at them in astonishment. Suddenly to Rasha, the soldiers seemed like normal people. I do not know how they can do something like this, but at the same time treat people so badly, she said genuinely confused. I do not know if they have two personalities or exactly how it works. Soon the van was on its way back to Ramallah, leaving its passengers to wonder who those soldiers were and what it might be like to meet them under different circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Ramsey.